back. We are still in Paris, still doing the courtesan's arc of this podcast. And today we have a woman who made an appearance in our last episode, if you caught that. Otherwise, you might want to go listen to that first. We have Valtes. Mr. Fuji's godmother of courtesanship. Yes. But we begin where Valtes is born Emily Louise de la Bigne. Not long after a bloody regime change during which King Louis Philippe the First abdicated. Yeah, turmoil. Turmoil in France, turmoil in the family. She's born illegitimate, the eldest child of a provincial woman who came to Paris and worked as a laundress at a school before falling pregnant. That sounds um inauspicious. Was this a wanted pregnancy? This was an accidental pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Her father was a teacher. However, he's not on her birth certificate. Does he claim her officially, or does he kind of unofficially claim her, or does he completely disavow her? Well, he hangs around long enough to father her six siblings, but he never marries her mother, and she eventually throws him out. Wow, um, okay. As you were saying, familial turmoil. Yes, so now her mother also becomes a part-time prostitute. It's- You know, if you're already dishonored. Now, was at this time and in this place, was there like a high, like, was it important for women to only have sex during marriage? Like, was that a really important thing at that time? Yes, we still have the dictomy of the good little housefrau, housewife, and the fallen woman tempting men in the streets. Gotcha. And so since she has had these illegitimate children, that's kind of her option. Yes, while continuing also to essentially do blue-collar work. She doesn't become a prostitute Mm full-time. However, subsequently, Valtes spent a great deal of time out in the streets to avoid when her mother brought a client home. Makes sense. That would be rather awkward. Now, when she reached 13, her mother had her get a job in a dress shop. It was a good job for a very poor girl, and this forcing children to go work to help support the family was quite common in their social class. Also, there's the fact that her mother, who was raised in the countryside, would have been accustomed to children as young as seven or eight working. So she would have seen it as perfectly reasonable to send her eldest out before dawn and get her back at dusk. Wow. That is is a long time to be working, though, as a child. Yes, they had very long work days. Employers ignored an 1841 law that limited the hours children could work. Yeah. Do we have anything from Valtes about this time? Do we know how she felt about it? She was rather proud to be able to hand her mother money that she earned. Now, as stability was returning to France after political change, there was a surge for luxury goods, including clothes, and it was these Valtes was sewing. So it's her first contact with the possibility of a better life. But the wages are meager. And, of course, her mother took all the money she earned. That sounds really frustrating. Like, she's putting in all of this work, but it's kind of not getting the rewards for it. Is there kind of a future in which she will? Not at this point in time. She is very much a child, and her mother is very much in charge of everything. Mm -hmm. However... This isn't a Cinderella story. Her walks home are dangerous, and she doesn't escape unharmed. Like many of her contemporaries, she caught the eye of an older man. As she would write later, Why is he protected by the world, the man who led me to that place, and who knew where he was leading me? Why does society have indulgent treasures to offer the wicked person? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right, that that she is in this place where she is um, doing work of various sorts, I guess, um, and she is not seeing any value being given to her, um, and she has no agency, and that this older man taking advantage of her is kind of, seems like an extension of that powerlessness that she already faces. Yes, but it opens up the rest of the world to her, the dark, seedy underbelly of Paris. From this, she decided that tenderness and emotional warmth were far too fickle. 
Material pleasure and security, on the other hand, could be obtained at a price. So like many of her class and situation, she turns to prostitution. She still has her job at the dress shop. She hasn't gone all in yet into the demi wand. So it's she's kind of where her mother's at at this point. And does her mother know about this? Does her mother, How does her mother feel about it? Her mother is aware of what she's doing. After a man left, for instance, she would come in and throw a sheet soaked in cold water over Valtes for the purpose of making her skin stay firm and so forth. And so forth. Well, in the biography, there was also a description about uh, her breasts becoming perkier and whatnot. Because of the cold sheet. Interesting. Okay. I mean... To each their own. I guess they didn't have as, as good science at the time, and they certainly didn't have plastic surgery, so. Yes, and her mother was quite proud of doing this for Valtes, after all. This is how she's going to make money. Yeah. That's rough. How old is she at this time, do we know? She's like 14, 15. Wow. Yeah, I I just can't imagine being the mother of a child who is that young. And just being like, yeah, well, you do your sex work on the side, and, and, you know, this is how you stay pretty. Yes, and in addition, Veltes was quick to develop a tough exterior, as some people would hit her, and some requests were quite odd. Yeah, no, as, as we were talking in the previous episode, that it could be traumatic for a lot of people, and that she is so young. Yes, and in the midst of this, she also changed jobs. She now worked in a bar that is the equivalent of Hooters. Great. So when she's not having sex semi against her will, she's being gawked at semi against her will. Sounds like a lot of fun. And drinking. Because I guess you could do that at the time. Yes. And in these bars, the wait staff, who were typically all women, were encouraged to drink along with the men to get the men to spend more money. Nice. I mean, I've also heard of, of women who work at strip clubs and places like that usually having some sort of intoxicant beforehand so they can get through it. So, And then at 16, she fell in love with Richard Fossey. Four years older than her, he was kind. He listened. His father was well-connected and his family was well-off, but Richard looked like he'd actually marry her. Hmm. The way you phrase that. We're not there yet. Mm. Instead, we go through a period of things looking up because she manages to get a job in the theater. What was she, she doing in the theater? Acting. Really? Yes. She even gets into an Offenbach production. So she has talent. Not so much. <laughs> but she has interesting looks, this striking redhead. Mm-hmm. It's also at this point that she changes her name to Valtes from the phrase Voter Altes which means your highness. I love it. So so as with other courtesans, um, she has stage presence and confidence, and she knows how to use it. Yes, and from the grave, she's probably beaming with pleasure because we are constantly calling her your highness this episode. Mm-hmm. And then it all came crashing down. Still unwed, she was pregnant at 18. Oof. However, after she gave birth to her daughter, she figured that Richard would make good on his promise to marry her. But he didn't have a job yet. He's still dependent on his father, so he dithered. Oh, come on. She fell pregnant again. A second daughter was born, and Richard's father pulled strings and sent him off to Algeria. Wow. Yes, with a nice, good civil service position. Mm Mm-hmm. And an engagement announcement to a perfectly suitable woman occurred not long after. Wow! That sucks! So now she has two kids, and no one to co-parent, and her guy is just in a foreign country? Like, what does she do? Well, Valtes is the single mother to two young, weak, health-wise children, the second of whom is also showing signs of mental disability, At the same time, she's been out of the theater due to the pregnancies. And so she decides this is the last time she ever trusts a man. Like, it makes sense that she never trusted a man after that. Yes. So what she does is she leaves her daughters with her mother, rarely sees them, 
but sends a monthly allowance for their upkeep. All while redoubling her efforts. She goes back into the theater, but again, she's not a very good actress. However, she catches Offenbach's attention. Mm -hmm. Now, while Offenbach, the famous composer, never flaunted his affairs, as he did love his wife dearly. So he loved his wife dearly enough to not be open about his affairs, but not enough to not have affairs. Well, yes, his wife actually got along with one of his more long-term mistresses, actually, uh, this affair with Valtes worries both his wife and his long-term mistress. Wonderful. Love it. Go on. <laughs> so while he doesn't flaunt his affairs right in front of his wife, but it's like an open secret, this affair does open doors for Valtes. She's invited to galas and mingles with a higher class of people. Now, as we said earlier, this affair does worry his wife and longer-term mistress, so the affair... Doesn't last long. An 1870 trip to Italy ends early as Offenbach's wife arrives at the hotel. She's grown so concerned she feels she must step in. And Valtes gracefully steps aside as the composer wasn't worth fighting over. Yeah, no, understandably, I can see being, what, is she still like 18 or something? <laughs> to be like, I'm not ready for this. 22, wasn't she? She'd be 22, yeah, that's how math works. You're right, you're right. <laughs> So, looking back in the distant past when I was 22, still would not have said, like, hmm, here's this established composer and his wife and his established mistress, and both of these two people don't want me to be in this relationship with him. I'm going to step away from this. Yes, and so she returns to Paris, now fully launching a career as a courtesan. Which makes sense, because now she's had this time to, like, mix with the upper crust. Um, she's, she's had a taste of the good life. And she's had an affair with a very famous, fairly wealthy composer. Mm -hmm. So people who know anything know that she is some form of compelling. Yes, it was all very good advertising. Mm -hmm. However, 1870 was not a good year for the French. For the Prussians, it was a magnificent year. <laughs> no. The Franco-Prussian War easily goes their way, and they win in 1871, taking Alsace and Lorraine as booty. Valtes during this time is in Nice, the fashionable winter destination. Naturally, the war does very little damage to her, and she only returns to the capital after the Paris Commune was crushed. I love it. Just daintily stepping around the politics. And the corpses. Mm, that too. Now, upon her re-entry into Paris, she bedazzles a Polish prince and becomes a society darling. Her mm. fortune grew. He went bankrupt. <laughs> nice. And she moved on. This rinse and repeat cycle would continue for her entire career. By 1873, police estimated her fortune at 300,000 francs, which is about $4 million today. Wow. That is impressive for just trading on her charms and her charms. Yes, and for only like three years. Yeah, wow. And it would only increase. For Valtes was not as frivolous as some of her colleagues, very much avoiding the whole lifestyle creep. Mm -hmm. And the various addictions. Mm -hmm. Well, that's lucky. To add to this wealth, Valtes decided to break her last name into three words instead of one thereby elevating herself to nobility. I only hope that the de la Bignes were an actual noble family in Normandy, the home of Valtes's mother. Huh. Is there any chance that there was, like, a relation there that, like, or, or maybe people from that area took on the name of their feudal masters or something? I don't really know. I know that she wasn't actually related to the nobility, as they called her a fraud and a social climber and schemer and scam artist and all those sorts of things. I bet they did. I mean, she's taking their name. Yes, and she now styles herself Countess de la Vigne, a ruse that was so successful that when she sent flowers to the emperor and empress, they actually believed she was a countess. <laughs> nice. Well, that days before Google. It was very nice. Yes, and it helped that the Rulers were rather out of touch with lists of French nobility. Mm, who has time to memorize all that? 
This was all right in line with her self-image. Elegant, worldly, sophisticated, and to add to it, she took the color blue as her trademark, decorating her clothes, home decor, and everything in shades of blue. In addition, the violet was her flower. Hmm. Now the violet has interesting connotations. Do we do we know of any uh, sapphic sensibilities that she might have held? As we will see, there's quite a lot of speculation as La Belle Epoque goes on. Mm-hmm. But for now, it's merely part of the color scheme. Yes, along with her nickname, Ray of Gold. She also would use Ego as a pseudonym when she wrote a book. Nice. However, as her career was on the up and up, her family life was still troubled. Both her daughters were sickly, and she had her mother move into the countryside with them. While the eldest thrived, her secondborn did not. She died. That is rough. Now, did Viltes have time to visit them a lot? Did she get to see her daughters? As we noted earlier, she rarely visited, and that was even when they were still in Paris. I imagine after they moved outside of the city, that visits just continued to decrease. Even as her secondborn was more sickly. That just sounds rough. I mean, I can understand, like, having to put a lot of time into her job, but... Yes, motherhood didn't fit the image of a courtesan at all, and she, at the time at least, preferred it that way. Valtes, though we know, never spoke about her feeling over the death. As far as everyone at the time knew, she wasn't even a mother. Wow, that sounds really rough. Instead, she kept going with her life in Paris. With her new fortune, she got a villa outside Paris through an extravagant party in honor of Napoleon Bonaparte's birthday, as she was a Bonapartist and ignored the disapproval of the police. I mean, sounds about right. (laughs) The dream of every street urchin cowering in fear of the cops, the ability to just thumb your noses at them. Mm Mm-hmm. She continued to have gatherings there and at her apartment in Paris. She also hung out with artists and devoured books, a luxury long dennied her when she was a poor linen maid's daughter in the alleys of the capital. Of course, reading everything would also set her apart from other courtesans with the ability to converse on a number of more serious topics. Mm Mm-hmm. An educated one. It would also bring her in contact with the writer Emile Zola. Zola was steered towards Valtes as he worked on his novel, Nana. She was impressed with him. He was one of the leading French novelists, so she gives him a tour of her home to help with his creative flow. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, the decor isn't the only thing in his novel. Nana is said to be modeled after Valtes herself, though at least one author says the character is modeled after the courtesan Blanche Dantigny. So could it have been a composite of these two courtesans? That is entirely possible. Valtes herself, we know, was not flattered with this comparison. Nana in the story is ignorant where Valtes is able to converse on practically anything. Where Nana is careless, Valtes adheres strictly to etiquette. Many took this actually as evidence that Zola hadn't understood Valtes at all. I mean, it certainly sounds like if it is based on her, he doesn't respect her a whole lot. Yeah, but I also think that's more the mores at the time as well. <clears throat> kind of the, the expectations of what a courtesan would be like. From there, she is also painted by Monet. The portrait was later exhibited and gained her even more publicity. By then, she had won the heart of Paris. Of course, she then proceeded to meddle in politics. Did not expect that, especially since so far she has kind of remained on the edges of that. Yes, but now she wades in. So, Valtes had a weakness for men in military uniform, And as a result, several of her lovers would get far-flung postings like French Indochina, hence her interest in French colonial affairs, and her lovers helped with filling her in on the goings-on. It also happened that her next-door neighbor was Leon Gambetta, a politician, and France was also having troubles with gaining Tonkin as a protectorate. Being an intelligent woman and finding the prospect thrilling, She began to plot. Wait, is she, like, plotting to to help France, like, be more of an imperial power? Yes. 
problematic fave. Go on. So she walks next door and proceeds to set about winning this politician's friendship. She succeeded. Mm-hmm. And so then when you later, say winning his friendship. Not in that way. Go on. <laughs> she succeeds and then proceeds to lay out her argument for a French protectorate, which would bring balance to the region while referencing history, geography, and current political systems. Very impressive for a courtesan. Yeah, it shows that she has had she's been doing a lot of thinking and she's looked at a lot of different sources for this. Yes, and Gambetta was impressed and he praised her for this. She was quite pleased, and this led to writing political articles for a time. Ooh, did she get published? Yes. Where? Le Journal Officiel. Sounds pretty official for a journal. Yes, however, family drama came up and put everything on the back burner. She argued with her mother over custody of her remaining daughter, in part due to the influence of Valtese's younger sister, who had become the madam of a brothel and enjoyed flaunting the family connection in order to get more business, something Valtes didn't take kindly to. No, I can imagine not. I mean, she's been promoting this idea that she's a countess, and here's your younger sister kind of putting a stop to that. Yes. Now, initially, it's resolved with a pact that would just send the girl to boarding school, and Valtes would actually visit her. Imagine! Yes, you're... Mother, who's been off running around writing political articles and having affairs with generals and counts and whatnot, is actually going to pay attention to you now. And it's a good thing, because as it emerged, the girl was visiting her aunt frequently with her grandmother and spending nights over in the brothel. Oh my goodness, no, that's not what you want. She is essentially being led towards prostitution by the relatives she's been entrusted to. And as we know, if I mean, prostitution is the thing that you can do, and clearly you can use it as a launching pad for moving up in the world. But um, you you do kind of want to be strategic about it, especially if you're in Valtese's position where um, you already have this class that you can trade on. Yes, but more importantly, Valtese is horrified and practically kidnaps her daughter from boarding school, and the whole thing ends up in court. Oof. Tongues wagged newspapers had a field day. Everyone speculated about her motives and her fitness as a parent, and it all threatened her career. Well, naturally. I mean, it's like when a boy band member has a wife suddenly. You're like, wait a minute. I thought he was perpetually available to me. As we stated previously, motherhood and being a courtesan doesn't fit well. It's not conducive to the image of the demimonde. So, it all goes to court, and in November 1881, the hearing opens. Both sides were heard. Her mother's lawyer attacked her fitness based on her career as a courtesan, her failure in the theater, her running around with artists, her meddling in politics, and called her novel sordid and said the main character was exactly like her, a true-to-life portrait. He closed with the woman obviously wasn't fit to be a mother, whereas his client had been raising the girl practically from birth. Mm-hmm. And was also um, a sex worker and had also been bringing her into a house of prostitution. Not to say that that disqualifies someone from being a good parent. I'm just saying it seems like his argument is kind of flawed. Well, he's not harping on that. Instead, he's harping on the narrative of this poverty stricken linen maid working tirelessly and selflessly, raising six children and now raising her grandchild. and so forth, as opposed to her daughter, who is a well-known courtesan. Mm-hmm. No. And I get that. And to be fair, I don't know how good of a mother Valtes would be, because we haven't really seen her be a mother. Correct. However, it's now Valtes's turn. There's the payments for the girl's upkeep, the initial entrustment believing her mother too old to repeat the goings-on of Valtes's own childhood, which turned out to be untrue, as evidenced by the catalyst that provoked this case in the first place. Mm. The attacks on her mother's character for having seven children and spending little time and affection on them. Her own stint in prostitution. And then this was the tightrope they were walking. The assertion of the mother-child bond and Valtese's natural rights to the child. So she's doing the opposite of what she did earlier on of 
I can only be a courtesan. There can't be any motherhood whatsoever. But now she's asserting the motherhood over the courtesanship. Interesting choice. And then, of course, there is, after all, the fact that Veltes wanted her daughter to have the education that she herself never received, hence the boarding school. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. She's trying to better her. And then, of course, there were the subdued waterworks and Veltes's own speech. My mother may accuse me, treat me badly, insult me if she wishes. But if she forgets that I am her daughter, I cannot forget she is my mother. And a mother is sacred. As for my conduct towards my daughter, in the irregular situation in which I found myself, never, outside this hearing, has her name been mentioned. I have friends I have known for ten years who do not even know that I have a daughter. My daughter is twelve today. If I have removed her from her grandmother's care, it is because I have discovered things concerning the child which have made me afraid. That is to say, that if, as a daughter, I cannot judge my mother, as a mother I must protect my daughter." Of course, Richard Fossey, the father himself, had nothing to do with the trial over his daughter. Butthead. Well, it's not as if he's been supporting her. No, no, it sounds like he's just entirely... Actually, do we know anything about him after this? Like, does he ever contact Valtes again? He and Valtes actually write, and reading the correspondence, it's rather warm, but considering Valtes was very good at detaching herself from at least the physical aspects of her career, I would say it's quite likely she could also detach herself from emotional episodes. Mm -hmm. I can see um, if he has not demonstrated that he is going to be there for his daughters that, um, or for Valtes, that she has kind of decided we will be cordial with each other. We don't need to be fighting, but this man does not need to have an emotional hold on me. Lucky for Valtes, she wins the case. Ha ha, for once. Yes, and as one lawyer said, courtesans for the most part give their children an even stricter upbringing than other women. <laughs> Is that true? Do we have any, like, basis for that? Whether or not it's true, it didn't matter, because now Valtes had her daughter, who continued her education, and did not become a prostitute all at the risk to her own reputation and career as a courtesan. So it sounds like Valtes did the right thing. Yes, it was a gamble that paid off. And speaking of gambles, mm -hmm. we're back to politics. France did take Tonkin, in no small part due to Valtes's political articles and discussions with Gambetta. Problematic faith. We also now have mentoring to be done. Mm -hmm. And since she's not mentoring her daughter in the ways of the courtesan. As we went over in Leanne de Pugy's episode, Valtes mentored the younger courtesan when she was first starting out in the necessary arts and finances of the profession, from techniques to trademarks to legal issues to how not to spend all your money at once you're going to need it for retirement. Now, do we know why she picked de Pugy? So Valtes was always... A bit soft-hearted when it came to Parisians less fortunate than herself. It's why there were actually three categories of men she slept with, and one of those categories was men she didn't charge. Oh. And it probably helped that when they instantly warmed to each other, Leanne was in awe of Valtes's success and essentially posed no threat to Valtes. I see. We should also note that at the time... Courtesans were considered to be old at 20, and Veltes is very much past her 20s. I see, yes. So she sees kind of her lasting legacy as um, helping this younger courtesan find her feet. Yes, and the youngster was grateful for any advice or guidance. Mm -hmm. So no harm in helping this enthusiastic young woman who knows nothing. Mm -hmm. However, all this does not go without some speculation. Mm hmm. As Valtes did not much like men considering her previous experiences and how closed off she had grown, especially with anything physical, and due to her group of close female friends, speculation ensued. Mm hmm. Of the sapphic variety. Yes. Now, despite her associations with Leanne de Pugy and Emmeline de Lenson, 
There is never any definitive evidence either way. Of course, the mystery kept her in the public's mind. I can imagine. So maybe it was profitable for her to keep those rumors flowing. Now, in the meantime, her daughter, now in her 20s, gets engaged. And it very much frees Beltes to do what she pleases, including visiting Nice and Monaco and so forth. Do we have any sense of the, the man to whom the daughter gets engaged? So we know that he is a respectable young railway company employee. Hmm. All right. Sounds good. Solidly bourgeoisie. Mm hmm. Do we know anything about their, like, what their relationship was like, or has that faded in the mists of time? We don't really know that. We only know that they have three children. One of the girls becomes Leanne de Pugy's goddaughter. Eventually pisses off de Pugy by cheaply selling off letters between Veltes and Leanne after the former's death. Right. Yeah. So, if nothing else, that family becomes solidly bougie and is not uh, as as tight in the courtesan world as, as they are. But time kept moving on. Veltes was getting older, and as we know before, a courtesan is old at 20. So now at 55, her network of contacts is failing. Yeah, what, understandable. What, what could you do? Yes, and one could say that business was shriveling up. Among other things. Yes, so she began planning her exit. In 1902, she auctioned off all, all of her property, the houses and apartments, even the furnishings. She made over $6.8 in today's currency in just five days. She then bought a nice, less attention-grabbing house. I feel like this is a thing that a lot of people do when they retire. <laughs> She's just doing it a bit earlier. Well, she's maybe a, a bit of a different situation from most other people, given uh, all of the wealth she has uh, gotten in this particular field. Yes, and then in 1909, she fell ill with vascular complications, had surgery, and was thrilled at the news of her protege, Leanne, marrying a Romanian prince. Yeah, that's got to feel like a success to her. It very much was. However, her own health is rapidly deteriorating. So she ordered her coffin. She no orders cards, her own coffin. It doesn't end there because she also orders her note cards for the funeral announcement and the grave marker she wanted. Wow. Wow. That's such a, like, depressing and goth thing to do. Like, yeah, I feel like I'm on my way out. And she's still only in her, like, 50s, right? Like, how old is she now? She is in her early 60s. Yeah, not, not the end for most people, even then. Either way, when her doctor tells her she has only a few hours to live, and this is only a few months after Leanne marries her Romanian prince, Valtes sends for the cards and personally inscribed each with the date of her death. Wow! She dies the evening of July 29th, 1910, at the age of 62, though her certificate would proclaim that she was 48. Oh, naturally. She was then buried in the cemetery of her previous villa. And while some of her descendants went into film and several even kept the appropriate nobility, Valtes is not as well known today as some other courtesans were. Which is really too bad. It sounds like she lived a really full life that despite her early hardships and kind of ongoing problems with um, making sure she could be there for her children, um, it sounds like she really carved out a space for herself in French society at the time. She did, and she did quite literally carve out her place, I would say. Mm -hmm. Thank you ever so much for listening. Subscribe if you want to. Check us out on Twitter. And remember, even if you can't act, the composer can always springboard your career.